Welcome everyone to the next session. Uh, welcome here uh, Christian and Michael from uh, Technology Center, Linux Expert Center, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, explaining us uh, their journey uh, on open sourcing uh, WFX. So, welcome to our journey to open source. We have open source the WFX. What is it? Um, essentially, it's a workflow executor, very lightweight and generic, so you can use it for different purposes, as you will see. Um, a workflow is a finite state machine, as you can see over here. And this one is worked through with the WFX as the controlling element and a client. Both work in lockstep through this state machine, and thereby you can execute any workflow essentially as you like. So one example is the firmware update backend. Um, essentially, it works as an alternative to you may know Hawkbit or Mendio. Um, now with WFX being open source, you can just replace Hawkbit or start Greenfield with the WFX right away and use that as a firmware update backend. This is where it actually started. So initially, it was um, an idea to replace something like Hawkbit that um, combines, for example, the device registry, an artifact storage, and a state machine into one big bundle. We wanted to have something more generic, flexible, lightweight, and versatile. Therefore, we came up with the WFX. Um, as well, you can use it for fleet management. So the original version of the WFX wasn't capable of doing this, but meanwhile, it was rewritten several times, has been extended to this as well. Um, you can do configuration deployment, you can do remote access, so think of you have a device in the field and you want to have a quick terminal session on this device to say recover it or do something with it. Um, a perfect match making this a reality with the WFX and essentially anything you can imagine what a workflow might execute on a remote device. So it's pretty useful for anything related to device management and even something beyond. The journey we promised actually started in a bit before 2018 um, when we had Hawkbit in use. By then, we had several use cases within Siemens um, that we wanted to kind of fit to Hawkbit, but quickly found out that the state machine that Hawkbit has was essentially fixed. So it has a fixed set of states those states had to be go th gone through with the device and Hawkbit in lockstep, so same idea as WFX, but still it was not extendable. Um, different Siemens products or use cases had the need for some more states in between, so it was simply not possible with Hawkbit. Uh, we actually contributed to Hawkbit a patch so that we got one more state into it, but uh, due to the nature and the architecture of Hawkbit, this was a bit of a pain. So we came up with a different idea. Let's make it more simple. Let's strip it down to the very basics. This is what we did back in 2018. Um, so we had a flexible update state machine with the on-device prototype. Back then it was still a prototype to showcase, to test the idea. And we did um, as well the backend so that both can work in lockstep through this machinery. Then in 2020, it was adopted by the Industrial Edge as a firmware update backend. Um, back then, it was still proprietary. There were different implementations within Siemens with different feature sets. Um, and eventually, two years later, 2022, we thought, well, um, this has become so in principle. Why limit it to just firmware update? Why can't we do something more with it, something more generic? And then the idea was, okay, if we now make a workflow based on a well-defined state machine, so the syntax and semantics, what the different states mean, how they are processed by the WFX and the device in lockstep, um, essentially you can do anything with this that demands some form of remote control. So idea was there, and then we said, okay, um, we had the idea, we thought about it, and we trashed the implementation because, well, it was not working. After having done this, we did the re-architecture, um, thought about already back then, what would we do in terms of architecture, modularity, code quality, 
if we eventually want to open source it. Um, Thereafter, so roughly in November, December, there was the first prototype of the WFX with the according SW Update backend. Um, SW Update is an on device agent that does the heavy lifting of applying firmware updates on devices. It's being used heavily inside Siemens. We are also the second most contributors to this project. So we developed WFX and SW Update in, in conjunction, in lockstep. Um, and then eventually, in last year, we made it open source. So now you can go to GitHub slash Siemens WFX, get a copy of it, and do whatever you want, as long as you can formulate this as a state machine. Why open source? And um, why did we have the idea to make it open source already back then in 2021 or something? Um, the idea was that by making it open source, we do improve the quality of the WFX code as well as the client code that we also open sourced for SW Update, for example. Um, this is a very big benefit of open sourcing stuff. Um, it also allows us to make an easy collaboration with different Siemens units. So by putting it out in the open, anyone even within Siemens can take it, make use of it makes things easier, but not just within Siemens, but also with customers, um, colleagues, whatever, um, competitors even, but that's okay. Um, and we thought, okay, this is a strategic decision to make such a project open source because there was a void in this space. So you have essentially Mendio, you have Hawkbit, which is kind of lacking behind already back then. Um, there was a place for a new product, a new thing, a new open source software that you can just place in this world. And this may become WFX. So there was a strategic decision, discussion, why to do this. And last but not least, it's doing the right thing. So we thought we had something that others may find useful. We can leverage synergies here, work with the communities on this one. So it's meaningful and maybe impactful. Why not do it? Um, of course, there is some cons involved, which means essentially a bit more effort if you do it in the open than if you do it behind closed doors. But this was very well worth the effort, so we decided let's go open source. If you now have a, a company-sponsored open source project, there is a bit more involved. So if I'm on my own in my cellar and doing stuff, I can do whatever I want. Um, if it's company-sponsored, you have to have sustainable funding. Meaning if you put something out and thereafter it gets cancelled for whatever reason, that's not really good. So you have to have uh, sustainable funding. And as it's company sponsored, it has to have some utility for the company and that should last over whatever time period you have there. Um, as well as you open this under the flag, so to say, of your employer, um, you have to know the stakes, which means there is a bit of reputation involved, yours as well as the company's. And as said again, good quality. Um, this is a must if you do it in the open source way. But anyway, that's how it is, even if you do private projects. And the last thing is the community involvement. So we already had some issues. We had discussions about issues. We had a few contributions. Um, this is fine. We are just starting this. As a, this is an infrastructure project. People are not going to replay stuff they have immediately just because this is out. But instead, they will use or consider this for the next prototypes and eventually this will run. So this is not a project, this is not as sexy that you just take it because it's there. But you have to have some, say, lead time until this works. And for this, you have to have the company funding and backing. And with this, I'm handing over for the technical details to Michael. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, so <coughs> you've decided to go open source. Uh, what are the preparations? Um, so in general, you need to find an OSS license. Um, we chose uh, Apache 2.0. Um, yeah, but of course, it has to make sense for the project. Um, yeah, then you might want to polish your code again. Um, yeah, have it reviewed. Again, hopefully, <laughs> um, yeah, 
you have to remove any trademarks. Um, you might want to clean up your, your Git history uh, or even squash it to start uh, fresh again, which we did. Um, yeah, and of course, everyone follows state-of-the-art best practices um, already. But yeah, you might have to adjust your CI pipelines. In our case, we had to migrate from uh, GitLab to GitHub Actions, <coughs> which yeah also takes a little bit of time and testing. Yeah, then there are some yeah company-specific things you have to do. Um, I will tell you what we had to do for Siemens. Um, yeah, it's not that much, and actually it was a quite quick process. Um, we had to get uh, sign-offs from a few people in Siemens, uh, our third-party software manager, uh, a legal rep representative, the intellectual property department, um, to make sure we don't hand out any um, secrets, <coughs> which we don't in this case. So WFX is really simple um, and fine to hand out even to competitors, so we hope for collaboration. Um, yeah, then this depends on your business unit, so this might vary from even within a company, um, whether you need a contributor's license agreement or if it's enough to have a developer certificate of origin. Um, so the CLA is a bit more of a formal process, uh, which might hinder uh, contributions because contributors, uh, if they work for a company, they might have to talk to some people within their company, which yeah can take some time and yeah might yeah they might have other things to do. So um, in our case, it was enough to have a DCO like the Linux kernel, which basically just means the developers have to sign off their commits and say. By, by signing off the commits, they uh, certify this is my work and yeah, it's fine to contribute. Um, yeah, and in the case of Siemens, we also had to do some export control classification, um, which was also fine in this case. Yeah, once you have this uh, approval document from the step before, then it's actually only uh, three steps. Um, you create a merge request uh, on our internal GitLab instance. And yeah, once this is merged, uh, and for this uh, merge request, you have to attach uh, the, the approval document. And as soon as the merge request uh, has been merged, ACI pipeline runs and sets, set ups, sets up your uh, GitHub repository automatically. And yeah, then you can push whenever you want to. Um, so it's actually very simple and very nicely automated. <clears throat> yeah, so once you've pushed um, your code, um, there are some things you can do to make your life a little bit easier. And yeah, I just want to share what we have um, done to make our life as a maintainer a bit easier. Um, so that we can spend more time on implementing new features, for example, and less time on boring maintenance. Um, yeah, of course, it's good to have a lot of tests in place, um, so that if you upgrade something, you will find regressions easily. Um, yeah, we have a load test available um, to find regressions in response times. Um, it's still we have still have to run it manually at the moment, um, mainly because. Yeah, it's, it's hard to have reliable um, performance on shared runners. Um, yeah, then we use the code coverage provided by CodeCuff.io, which is has a very nice UI um, to find some white spots in your code coverage. Um, yeah, this is updated with every CI run. It's also it also runs for every merge request, and you can configure that. The overall, overall code coverage must not decrease. Um, yeah, uh, third-party dependency, dependencies, we still keep up to date with uh, GitHub's Dependabot, mainly because it was yeah, for free, no, no really setup necessary. Um, but I do have some plans um, to, to switch to 
uh, renovate, which we saw in the talk before. Uh, mainly it's because it's more configurable. And I, so there are still some dependencies in our CI pipeline which use latest greatest. Um, and I al already had the case where I wanted to have an older version and not latest greatest. So my, uh, my wish is to pin down every dependency, but I don't want to update them manually. And for this, I will make use of the uh, regex feature of renovate bot. So this will probably come this year. Um, yeah, we also have some automated testing for race conditions, which uh, is provided by Go for free, which is very nice and even found a few bucks in the code. Um, yeah, something yeah, a bit more unusual maybe. Um, there is a um, CI pipeline which runs for merge requests and which ensures that the commits are actually signed off. Um, if you remember, we have the developer certificate of origin, so um, every commit needs to have the sign off and it's quite easy to forget this. And as a maintainer, it's also easy to forget to check this if you see a merge request. Um, so that's why it's good to automate this kind of stuff. And yeah, there is a workflow available on GitHub Actions which does this and yeah, this is quite useful. Um, yeah, we do have some generated code and this is also checked in, um, mainly because it makes life for developers a lot easier if you don't have to install like 10 different tools in the right versions um, to compile the project locally. And this is also nice if you upgrade some code generation tool, um, you see a nice diff of what has actually changed in your code base. And yeah, there's also a CI pipeline which ensures that the generated code um, yeah, is not modified. Um, then the release process is also very simple. Um, yeah, you just push a git tag and then the CI pipeline runs and publishes a new release on GitHub. So that's very convenient. Yeah, and yeah, we're already coming to the end. So like Christian mentioned in the introduction, WFX is very lightweight, simple, um, a general purpose workflow machine. Um, yeah, but it's really not much. It, it keeps track of the state, but um, the interesting stuff happens on the client. So on the client, you have to implement yourself um, if there is no uh, implementation available, available which does the job for you. In the case of SW update, there is a client integration which you can use, but if you want to do, if you have some other use case, you might have to write the client yourself. Um, but there are libraries. So there's a library in the WFX repository which you can use to easily write your um, client. And there are also examples um, like the remote terminal access or the remote configuration management demos. So for these two, there are clients available in the WFX repository, which you can use as a basis to, to write your own clients. And yeah, there are also some new features available, um, which we have implemented this year, I think. Um, there are job event notifications, which um, yeah, allow you to get notified if something, if the state changes and you can then react on it, uh, to it. And there is a plugin system, so you can write plugins which run on incoming requests, and then you can do like request uh, rewriting, uh, which you, for example, could use for multi-tenancy or other use cases. Yeah, and last but not least, there is a demo. Um, in the top, I run the WFX, which you can barely see here, but that's fine. Um, so you just see some logs. Here are the pretty logs. There are also JSON log output, which you can then feed uh, wherever you want to for better, better analysis. Um, yeah, here I created a workflow. And here I'm creating a job using the command line. Um, and here is the, the client which applies the config deployment change. So it's waiting for a job right now. 
it polls every x seconds, it found a job, it does something, and reports back the state to WFX. Um, yeah, the demo is also available on the website, where you can hopefully read it better. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's it. Um, thank you. Any questions? Yes, okay. So thanks for the great talk. Um, one question I was wondering about the CLA. Um, so if I remember correctly, for Edge Shark, I actually um, had to sign one. And I always feel dirty if I have to do that. Um, but I guess they have some reasons. So I'm confused. Um, uh, Edge Shark seems DIFA. WFX seems also to be arranged around DIFA. Um, can you elaborate a little bit? How did you manage to get around that one? We, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not published by DIFA, it's used by DIFA, it's published by technology and I guess for us it was fine. So different process. Yeah, that's what I meant, it can even vary within a company. Um, it's easier in T than it is in DI. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, to you. Great talk. Um, so if you uh, can control multiple clients, so um, how does it scale um, over multiple clients? Did you have some tests, some um, limitations, and uh, yeah, will it scale to a million devices? So if you think big, will it work? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the, 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 the longer answer is essentially you have a client that communicates to one WFX instance. Now, if you have multiple clients, if you want to play it excessive, you can have a million of WFX instances, each one for one client. Or you can do, for example, sharding. So you can scale horizontally. And we had those fleet management examples. Essentially, with this, you build up a hierarchy of WFXs so that you have one that controls your tree of WFXs, so to say, where the leaves are devices again. So this is built to scale, yes. And um, essentially, what you do there is you just exchange control messages. So those are not too big, right? The data comes from somewhere else usually. So for example, S3 buckets, your artifact storage, you have on-premise something. Um, so it's really just control traffic that you have over there. And this scales pretty well. So we have law tests with which you can play around and, and test. And granted, depending on where you run the WFX, there is some sweet spot. So that you don't overload your machine. But if you have auto scale on on WFX, uh, on, on AWS, um, this, this works. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so the first use case was uh, firmware updates or to go beyond what Hawkpit offers. Um, I was wondering, are there some other nice projects to give the full functionality? So you mentioned like artifact repository, but there's also front end, this uh, kind of um, mass rollout planning and so on. Is there anything available? Uh, not yet. So the idea was to decouple this because those are different aspects. So having the device registry, having an artifact storage and having the state machine. The central piece and part of this is the state machine and ripping this out of Hawkbit means you don't have to mirror your already existing device registry into Hawkbits so that this can drive the state machine. Um, you can bundle this, so there are multiple databases supported, MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, whatnot. Um, you have probably bindings to your own artifact storage. So this is very flexible, embeddable. The design goal initially was to make this usable for greenfield as well as for brownfield scenarios where you want to get rid of those mirroring things. Um, yeah, that's essentially it. Um, for the UI part, the, the Hawkbit UI is a bit deprecated nowadays as well. Um, so essentially there is no good one. Uh, we do have a proof of concept UI for the WFX internally as of now, just to, to have something to showcase because looking at terminals for managers is boring. Um, yes, we think about open sourcing this as well, um, but this takes a bit of time. Regarding the mass rollout feature, you've seen the fleet management thing where you can put WFXs in a hierarchy. 
And with this and having different workflows, so the leaf WF access have the device update workflows and the intermediate ones have the fleet management workflows over multiple WF access where multiple devices are in. With this, you can model um, such a rollout feature even in a more flexible way than you can do with Hawkbit. So yes, possible, but that's not too obvious. So in Hawkbit, you click a button, you have it. Um, here, you have to do something. That's the price of flexibility. And just to add, uh, WFX is also used within Siemens for other things than firmware update already. But in essence, you have to write this client, but this client means you have to write a REST client that communicates with the WFX and does something based on the state it is in. And as I said, there is a library available in WFX um, GitHub's repository, Go, but writing a REST client is common thing nowadays, and we even plan to open source a Lua library, so my favorite language, <laughs> um, then it's even easier. And this is already an SW update. So the SW update client part can be generalized and then put into WFX's repository so that you can use nowadays Go and then Lua, or whatever you like, because it's just a REST client. Yeah, and you can just gener you should generate a uh, client binding for your programming language because the API is in open API format um, for which yeah, client generators exist for most programming languages. Exactly, a follow-up. Um, so we, we have this use case of devices behind gateways. So this is this building X stuff where we have the edge devices, but then the de uh, field devices behind it. And you basically need the local execution. And you mentioned hierarchical workflows. Should this be easy to yes. realize with that? Yes. So this then. one here is roughly 20 megabytes Go binary, statically linked. You can put this on the device. Essentially, we have used this in a Lava test farm where the cloud in a box use case essentially had to be done by some means. And this is what WFX was perfect for. Because it's small, you can put the whole cloud stuff or the behavior of the cloud into the box, onto the edge box, and run the tests locally. So in your case, you can put a WFX on the edge box that then um, controls the device behind devices. Or you can do something like uh, proxying if you use SW update, if you go to the firmware update use case where this is also possible. That depends. So as it is so small, uh, you can embed it almost everywhere and control it by the on-premise or cloud version of a WFX. It's a product, so to say, that you take off the shelf and just implement it rather than it's a toolbox, it's a framework. Thank you.